If you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 13, and we're going to begin reading in verse 21. Gospel of John chapter 13, beginning in verse 21. The Bible says, when Jesus had thus said, <clears throat> excuse me, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, said, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your precious word this morning, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your presence and your might and your strength. Lord, we pray that you bless your word in a wonderful way to the hearers this morning that we might understand and know the blessings that are, are found in being close to you. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll be preaching this morning on how close are you to Jesus. Now, that is a question that only you can answer uh, you can make things look good, and you can make things look uh, as they are fine, but at the end of the day, uh, only you know how close you are to Jesus. Amen. But this I do know, the closer the better. Uh, the nearer you are unto Christ, the better for you. Uh, the closer you are to Christ, the less you'll love this world. Uh, you know, uh, many, many years I have... Uh, preached on biblical separation from this present evil world, but I found of recent the key to that is in whom you love. Because if you love Jesus and you're close to Jesus, the rest will fall into place. And if you don't, or something comes before him, it will not. Right. Uh, because, why? Because you love that more than you love Christ. And, and so we find uh, an unusual set of scripture here. If you know... Um, and you know your Bible, uh, just before this, he had washed the saints' feet. And he, uh, he did this to illustrate servitude. He illustrated uh, uh, an humbleness that come with the office of the Lamb. And he, and he illustrated something that we should be doing. In fact, later on, he says you ought to wash one another's feet. But I want you to see... That in this state of humility, he, he reveals what he already knows. And that was the betrayal that was about to happen. Mm -hmm. the, the betrayal that was already in the works. So in the 21st verse, the Bible says, When Jesus had thus said, uh, and that was uh, uh, in receiving uh, strangers, in receiving people, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit. Yeah. Now, I want you to see that as a little s spirit, meaning he wasn't troubled in or by the Holy Ghost. He was troubled within. Now, we live in a day and age probably more so than should be that God's people are troubled in spirit. Now, the next time you get there, and there's going to be issues that come up, remember this, God's in control. Uh, not one thing is occur, occur that isn't in the divine plan of God, and there's no need to be troubled. Now, the reality is this, just like Christ, we have this flesh to deal with. Mm -hmm. And certainly if Christ was troubled in spirit, you're going to have times along the way where you're going to be discouraged, you're going to be scared, you're going to be upset, you're going to find yourself in tears because Christ did. Uh, you remember one time it says that Christ was weary, mm -hmm. that he was just completely wore out. And, and we will experience those times too. But when you do, uh, uh, pray for the reminder that God is in control. 
When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Now, the first indicator that I find here is that you may have people fooled, but certainly you don't have Christ fooled. If you are far from Christ, he knows it. If you're not leaning on his bosom, or even at his, you know, uh, that one uh, woman with the issue of blood just yeah. was, was satisfied with touching the hem Amen. of his garment. Mm -hmm. I would be too. And, and But if you're not close enough to reach out to the hem, I don't know what but God does. Uh, and, and, and so... Uh, with, with his full knowledge of the Godhead, uh, just as he much was the full flesh of mankind, he says, one of you uh, are going to betray me. And he did know who it was. He certainly did. Now, some people will try to say that he chose Judas to be the betrayer, but that's not true. He knew who he was. In fact, before this occasion, he had already went to the Jews. Uh, and, and it says, I believe, and from that time forward he saw opportunity right and uh that was that was the that was the nature and the makeup of whom judas was but uh i want you to see and understand this that christ knew that all the way back to the time that he named judas an apostle i think all four gospels but i know three gospels for sure will uh goes through the list of apostles and judas is already there and he called him not only to be a disciple, but he set him apart to be an apostle, full well knowing what the end result was going to be. But yet and still troubled at the plan of God. You know, I've always said this, and I certainly mean it to be true even today. I'm not afraid of dying, but sometimes I'm afraid of how I get there. And I think that's a genuine uh, a genuine concern of the flesh, don't you? Uh, that's just that's just how we're geared and made up. Verse twenty-two. Then the disciples looked one on another. Now that's a very significant thing because what didn't they do? They did, but one of them didn't look within self. Uh, I bet it. I bet you anything, it's Jared, right? <laughs> Kind of the, the the nature of the flesh, is it not? Mm -hmm. They, uh, you know what? It's easier to evaluate someone else than it is to evaluate yourself. That's right, amen. You know, uh, uh, have you ever tried to take your own blood pressure? It, it it's very hard even just to get the cuff up. And it's a whole lot better. <laughs> For someone to do it for you, but it can be done. I've taken my own blood pressure. I've drawn my own, own blood. Uh, but it was, it, it's a very difficult thing. Uh, when I was having to get my kidney enzymes, I think it was twice a week, but I know one time a week for sure, uh, I was drawing my own blood at the office and one of my physical therapists came in and thought I was shooting up. <laughs> and and uh, uh, we, uh, but it was easier to have Donna or one of the girls at work to do it. It's easier to say, ah, I know where the problem's at. But you know, it's worth your while. It's worth your while to look within. Uh -huh. It's worth your while to be, uh, inspect yourself. Yeah. But these individuals, just like the, the whole majority of us, began to look and began to wonder and say, you know what? I wonder what you're up to. Now, verse 23. Now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples. Now, if you know your Bible, they're about to uh, 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 institute, uh, and John's Gospel is not as clear on it, uh, the Lord's Supper. But they, they, were, were, they were doing the Passover they were preparing the Passover. They were observing the Passover. And we find the young John laying on the breast of Jesus. That's just about as close as you can get. Now, here in the South and, and being raised how we are, I would find it very awkward to lay on any man's breast. 
Uh, that, that, now, when Daddy was living, maybe. And I would still found it kind of awkward. You know what I'm saying? But I can't think. My sons, and I have found this, if they give me a hug, I draw them to me, not the other way around. And I think there's a lot of significance to that, too, don't you? Uh, your father draws yourself, draws his people to him. But, and, and, you know, and, and again, uh, I think it, it kind of dwells up in pride, but I can't think anybody in this room except maybe Adam and Donna that I would truly feel comfortable. Now, I would do it to anybody if that's what was needful, yeah. but laying my head on their breast. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it those two? Because I love them. And I wouldn't have no problem laying my, my head on Gracie's breast, but I'd probably draw her to me. You see what I'm saying? And the reason is, is I know him better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. So I believe the reason John was comfortable with this is that he loved Jesus more than the rest. I believe uh, he understood who Christ was better than anybody there, even Peter. And, and we'll have to think that Peter was at a distance because notice what he says in the next verse. And Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him, meaning John, one uh, uh, that he should ask whom it should who it should be of whom he spake. Now, uh, the way that I understand, and you see these tapestries and stuff, and they're mostly Catholic. I don't know uh, what's true, but the way that we observe the Lord's table isn't necessarily exact a biblical example. There's nothing wrong with it, but I would have to believe they were at a table because that's how the Passover was observed. It was at a table. It wasn't, it wasn't in a, a chapel. It, it, it wasn't in, in they, they had nothing like this. And, and so he was leaning on his bosom at the eating table, at the Passover table. Just in a few minutes, he would pick up and, and say, and institute the new, the, the new covenant. And he's laying there and he's, he's close unto the Lord, and there's other people way off. John, you ask him, you know where most of us live in that spot Peter was at? John, you ask him. You ever think that's probably one of the little minor things Catholicism started with? You ask him. You know what? This is the glorious truth of the blood of Jesus Christ. No one has to ask him but you. <laughs> we don't need John to go before us. We don't need Peter to go before us. We don't need Paul to go before us. We just need to lean on his breast and get some fresh information, get some truth uh, directly for ourselves. Now, how many of you this morning had difficulty hearing from God? I don't think I'm the only one. <laughs> Do you? Uh, well, I can tell you the problem is not me. It's not God. It's me. Anytime there's an issue with communication, it's not God. It's you. And you say, well, how could you possibly say that? Well, God don't change, and we do. Yeah. And James said, draw nine to me, and I, uh, uh, I will draw nine to you. Yeah. So again, it's all positional, is it not? It's all the nearness that you bear unto Christ, and, and, and only you can answer that, and sometimes the only way that we can get that is, is by the Holy Ghost saying, hey, you're not, you're not where you need to be. You're not, you're not where you were last year. You, you're not where you were 10 years ago. Get nearer unto Christ. And that's what we need to do. Notice in verse 26, Christ answered him. Now, I, will, I want you to notice this. He may have, 
But we never hear John sharing this. He never said, hey, Peter, he said it was Judas. Right? Uh, uh. It said, he, he whispered to John and said, it's the one that I give the salt to. He reached over there and popped it in Judas' mouth. And the best we know, John never shared it with anybody. So you get special messages in the nearness to Christ. You get things other people don't get. You, you enjoy truths that the average Christian do not when you're near unto Christ. And, and that's, the, that's the whole needfulness. That's the whole goal. That's the whole, the whole reason that we should be desirous this morning to be near unto Christ so that we can get a little more than the average. You know what? I don't want to be an average Christian. Do you? I don't want to be in the, in, in the plumb line. I want to be close unto Christ. I want to be tilted just as high as I possibly can get under the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? We need to get sick and tired of the plumb line. And we need to get to the point where we can enjoy Christ. We need to know Him better in 2022 than we did in 2021 uh, simply for ourselves. You know, I used to preach, and I still believe it's tr true, but I no longer find it the emphasis, not just because 2022 can be worse than 2021. Do it for yourself. Just do it for yourself. If you end the year a millionaire, <laughs> Do it for yourself. Be closer to Christ for your own benefit. For, for the encouragement and, and the zeal that comes with it. You know, I also have said this numerous times, and I believe I've come to the answer. Our churches lack zeal today. They're not concerned about the lost. They're not concerned about people dying and going to hell on a routine basis. Rather, they sit back at the plumb line. And do nothing. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we need to love like John loved. We need the closeness that John that John experienced. And the Lord will bless us with that. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. Matthew 17. Matthew 17 in the first verse. We find a few that did just that way. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John. I want you to notice that John is in this group, Peter's in this group, and James, the brother of Peter, <laughs> is in this group. And I also want you to see that they... Uh, they would later on down the road stick in this position for a long time. Even to the last day when he leaves the nine or the eight in one place and goes a little further and leaves the three and goes a little further to be by himself, that they're still a very significant group. Why were they there? I think they desired to be there. I think they proved themselves over three and a half years, don't you? Have you proved yourself? Uh, I, I've been saved 40 years. Have I proved myself? Sometimes I say, think sadly I have not. Uh, uh, and, and so we find that, that they had this privilege, I believe, because they desired it. Because they wanted to be closer unto Christ. And after six days, Jesus take, taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up unto a high mountain apart, a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elisha, talking with them. Then Peter then answered Peter and said, Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make one, make uh, three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. Uh, there was a very, very singular experience 
that Paul had. Yeah. And we're going to get to Paul in a minute. Uh, and it, it, he had to see Christ to get close to Christ. You have to see Christ to be saved. You have to be saved to be close unto Jesus. You can't, you can't be close to somebody you don't know, do you, can you? You know, uh, I like President Trump. He had a kind of a mean way about him, but I liked him. But you know what I know about President Trump? Just what I was told. Yeah. You ever think about that? Yeah. You know what I know about President Biden? Just what I've been told. And you know why? Because I've never met him. I, I've never shook hands with him. I've never spent time alone with him. How could I possibly know them? In the very same way with the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't know him until you spend time with him. And the only way to spend time with him is make it a priority. I believe these three young men had an interest in knowing Christ in a more intimate way than the other nine. I believe that they had a genuine interest to be close to him. And they both were used mightily because of it. John uh, saw him for who he was. Time and time again, describing, describing him as a deity, abasing himself and just calling him that disciple whom Jesus loved. Peter, the pastor of First Baptist Jerusalem, <coughs> used mightily unto the things of the Lord. Paul, the greatest missionary that ever lived. James, the first one that lost his head for the cross of Christ. You, you don't get there by being with the other nine. You don't get there by routine. You get there by deliberate service. I believe in, in the day which we live in, deliberate, uh, effective, uh, dedicated service is just about gone. It's no longer part of our makeup. It, it, it's no longer uh, part of whom we desire. Verse 6, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on the, excuse me, verse 5, and while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed uh, them, and they heard a voice out of the cloud that's, that which said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And we find that the apostles fall out, and, and, and they're dumbfounded, and they finally understand the singleness of Christ. He said, the, the, the God of all glory said, this is my son. You don't worry about Elisha. You, you, you don't worry about the other two. He is now the focal point. Yeah. Is he the focal point of your life? I have to say, sadly, sometimes he's not for me. Sometimes he's not the center. I get so busy. I get, I get so... Uh, caught up in the world that I don't always think about it like I should. That, that, that's where we need to be. Where he'd be our focal point and, and what will be granted if, if he is your focal point is this closeness that few ever observe. Acts chapter 9 and uh, you all have read this numerous times. I've preached to you numerous times out of it. But I I want you to uh, see some things from the salvation of Paul. Uh, the salvation of Paul, probably one of the most clear works of Christ in modern man that you can find. I want you to see the attitude of Paul in verse 10. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, meaning of the Christian, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound in Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about it from heaven, a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, um, Paul had done heard the gospel. When did he hear it? As he was holding the coats 
of a man, uh, for the stoners of a man named Stephen. Mm -hmm. And old Stephen looked up and said, I see the son standing at the right hand of the father. And you know what? I personally believe that, that Saul tried to, Paul tried to, but I don't think he ever forgot that. You know, uh, that's why I think later on, I think it's at the church at Corinth, he says that he shows the foolishness of preaching. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it dwelled on me. Uh, people who've heard the gospel spiritually, it will lay on them like a wet blanket. They cannot get away from it. They cannot stop thinking about their situation. And then we see the Lord Jesus manifested to, to Paul bodily, and he understands who he was, and, and the Lord saves him by his modern, uh, by his, his amazing grace, and then he makes him blind to this world. You know when you're going to get close to Christ when you're blind to this world? Yeah. You ever led a blind person? I have a number of times, and most of them will catch you right here. And you'll just guide them like this. I saw this uh, young couple, well, they're not young, they're as old as they've done. I saw this couple at the Florida conference, and I've seen them a number of times at different places, and the wife is blind. <clears throat> and she depends heavily on her husband. And when they're walking, she never gets this far from him. You know why? Because that's a safe spot for a blind person. You know, that's why Paul was never given his vision back. It's because he needed a safe place. See, you have to trust. You have to trust who's leading you. And more so than trust him, you have to be close to him. You have to be near him. You know, in modern religions, what you have, you have the blind leading the blind. What does the Bible say concerning that? They, they'll fall in the ditch. I, I want someone who sees well. I, I, I want to be so dependent on Christ that I, I'm right there next to him and following him as diligently I, as I can and depending fully on him. That's the spot that I need to be. Acts chapter 23. Acts 23. In verse 3. 10. Acts 23 and verse 10. And there arose a great dissension. The chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from them and to bring him unto the castle. Now, if you know your Bible, you know the situation that they're in, that he kind of split up the Sadducees and the Pharisees and those who believe in the resurrection and those who do not. And, and it worked for his benefit and saved him. And, and we, find, we find the king taking him up into the palace so that he would be saved. Now, notice in verse 11. Uh, first of all, I want you to think about how, how excited or, or how upset you would be if someone was pulling on one arm and another person was pulling on that arm for the, the whole... Uh, the whole goal was to who would be able to kill you? Who would have the pleasure to take you out? And pulling and pulling and pulling and then be rescued from that. I think you'd feel alone. I think you'd be discouraged. But Paul got up there in that, in that tower. And Jesus came by. You know why? Because he was close to him. You ever read, I think it's in... Maybe Ephesians, maybe Corinthians. And he, he lists what he'd been through. Thrice I was stoned. Uh, five times received out 39 stripes, saved one. And he, he, he lists the punishments. Now, first of all, I'll say this, probably none of us can handle it. But you know what that did? It pushed him closer and closer and closer to Christ. You know what physical harm and, and emotional harm will do to you? If you're in the right spirit, it'll push you closer to Christ. 
no matter what the situation is, no matter what the difficulty is, it, it has a purpose in our lives. And we find this horrible time that, that the Lord said, be of good cheer, uh, Paul, for as I, uh, thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem so much, you also bear witness of me to at Rome. So, you know what? The Lord Jesus Christ was evaluating how he was giving testimony at Jerusalem, how he was preaching of the things of Christ at Jerusalem, and he said, now boy, you're going to Rome. You know why he got to go to Rome? Because he was faithful. You know why you get to go to foreign lands to preach the name of the gospel? Because you're faithful. And the only thing that breeds faithfulness is nearness unto Christ. Close unto him. One place, and we're going to dismiss. Uh, Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. The Bible says this. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. You know what's going to happen? People are going to treat you very evil in this world. Uh, get used to it. it, it it's not going to get any better. No. Uh, now what should this evil do? It should drive you into the Lord. It, should, it shouldn't make you mad, although often it does for me. It should upset you and, and, and make you take vengeance on the person that's doing it, although it often does to me. But I want you to see it should drive you so you'll be on the bosom of the Lord, so you can hear his heartbeat, so you can understand exactly what's going on. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. What did he do? He turned it over to the Lord. Why could he do that? Because he's on the breast of Jesus. Verse 15. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our works. He's probably traveling around to other churches just like Alexander Campbell did. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all the men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. That's, that's someone that's close to the Lord. <clears throat> that even though he was being deserted, he was praying God would sustain them. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Uh, you know, uh, that's where we need to be. Uh, we need to be just as close mm -hmm. as we possibly can be. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow... Get up with a prayer on your heart that you may be closer still. Right. That, that the nearness may be given more and more. And the reason why is your love for Christ. You know why I'm comfortable of laying on the breast of Don and Adam and little Gracie and AJ if he let me. It's my level of love for him. And you know uh, why others I feel awkward? Because I don't know them as well. I mean, it's it just how it is. I love my daughter-in-law, but it kind of be creepy, would it not? I don't know them as well. So it comes down to this, how close are you to Christ? And only you can answer that. I can't answer it for you. Your wife, your husband can't answer it for you. But you can. 